Uh, John Lipsky joining us now. He's the number two at the IMF. And uh, we look ahead to how China has moved on in terms of its policy and what you made, make of it all. John, what did you do when you picked yourself up the, uh, off the floor when that surprise rate hike came in? Well, I, was, I wasn't on the floor. And the policies are certainly consistent with the broad direction of Chinese policy in the wake of the crisis. First of all, they implemented very strenuous fiscal stimulus to make sure the economy kept growing with a focus on boosting domestic demand. Uh, they have, uh, in June, uh, instituted a more flexible exchange rate policy that will help move in the same direction of providing better balance and focus to their economies. They've also seen, uh, they've also noted uh, relatively rapid growth and increases in asset prices, etc. And uh, in the longer term, they are going to want to move or they want to move toward a more domestically oriented economy and they need better financial controls. So greater use of in interest rate policies and other uh, financial sector policies will be important. So it's all of a coherent John. piece. Uh, this is one small bit. John, is it the case, I mean, I had a guest just now, Frederick Newman from HSBC, suggesting that this move was one to send, tell the world, A, that uh, they're doing just fine, growth is on track. Number two, they don't need to appreciate their currency or uh, revalue it, if you will, in order to rebalance their economy. Well, with all this talk of currency wars, etc., uh, it seems to me there's been an excessive focus on just this one issue. More broadly, in Pittsburgh last year, the G20 established their framework for strong, sustainable and balanced growth, established this innovative and crit uh, critical and crucial mutual assessment process in which all economies, advanced, emerging, surplus and deficit, all have policy shifts they need to do on a comprehensive basis. Currency adjustment is part of it, but only part of that process. Right. And, you know, what other levers can they use here? Well, for sure, in all, all of the G20 economies, there is an important role for structural reforms that will increase potential growth and economic efficiency. These are of different character in different economies. The advanced economies have aging populations and need to be concerned about that. Developing economies need to make sure that they uh, can better balance uh, their, growth for, their growth sources toward uh, sustainable domestic demand. Uh, everything is of uh, importance and it's going to be all be discussed at the G20 summit in two weeks. You mentioned currency wars. I mean, the noises and the rhetoric seems to be getting louder with regard to that. Uh, do you think it's just time that everybody just calm down a little about this? Uh, it wouldn't be bad, and it would be helpful if uh, the discussion took a broader perspective and rather than just focus on one aspect of this, uh, of this rather comprehensive uh, policy program. Currency adjustment will be part of global adjustment, but in the medium term, it has to be accompanied by fiscal balance, structural reforms, appropriate monetary policies. The announcement by China, I'm just going to get back to that, does come, well, the timing is quite crucial here, isn't it? And is it significant that it's just days before that meeting in Seoul? Well, it certainly will help to put things in perspective. The Chinese authorities announced, among other things, uh, more flexible currency policy in June, and the currency has been moving. Uh, earlier this week, they announced a new five-year plan designed to produce exactly the kind of results that we've been discussing. And this interest rate move is, as I said, in line. It's certainly not a major move, but it shows, it certainly in, indicates clearly that the Chinese authorities are going to rely more on conventional financial sector uh, interest rate uh, means, policy means, to provide support for a domestically uh, oriented economy. John, I just want to get to the IMF itself. The United States is putting a lot of pressure there to decrease the size of the board, and they want greater emerging market representation there. Do you think they're going to be successful, as we have Europeans at the moment resisting that? Well, I, I think you're putting it a, a little too starkly. Uh, it's clear in the Articles Agreement, the Constitution of the IMF, 
that representation of its 187 members should be in, in, uh, uh, guided by the relative economic weight of the member countries in the global economy. And with emerging markets growing at uh, triple the rate on average of the advanced economies right now, John Lipsky. there has been a substantial shift. Yes? John Lipsky, thank you so much for joining us. John Lipsky there of the International Monetary Fund as we look ahead to that G20 meeting of finance ministers which takes place in Seoul at the weekend.